Hi, my name is Russ Matthews with Real Dialogue. I had an interesting challenge a few months ago. I had a church approach me about giving a talk specifically in the book of Revelation, but how it compares to dystopian films. Two of my favorite topics is the Bible and also looking at film and bringing these two together. Now, I took on the challenge, but naively I thought that there would be a lot of content or resources to be able to talk about this subject not realizing that there had been a lot written on the book of Revelation, and there has been a fair bit written on, the, on dystopian films, but very little of anything bringing those two together. So this is kind of my journey, as it were, to kind of looking at how we can pull back the curtain on dystopia and looking at the connections and also the disconnections when it comes to dystopian films and Revelation. Now, there's two things I want to do for you before we get started in this introduction. Is One is just be able to go through a few films to be able to kind of get you an idea of what we're going to be looking at today. And then second, I'll be looking at three key audiences that would be interested potentially in this talk. So one is the films. What is dystopia or what are dystopian films? It's a really good question. I think there's some classics that you have like Blade Runner, Minority Report, Clockwork Orange, and say 12 Monkeys. And then you also have young adult fiction that would be like The Hunger Games and also Maze Runner. Or you could also even travel into the realm of Pixar. Pixar, WALL-E, was actually one of the best dystopian films in that genre. And then finally, the one that will probably connect most people is the superhero film or graphic novels. The Dark Knight with Batman and also Avengers Endgame are both dystopian films. And as I go through to describe that in the talk, you'll be able to understand a little bit more how these are all connected. But who are the audience for this talk? Well, that's a good question. And, and probably I'd say there's three key audiences. One would be those that really enjoy dystopian films and also really enjoy engaging with the Bible and maybe has never connect, connected those two. And this is really a talk for you. But two, it's also for those who maybe don't necessarily connect with dystopian films, but want to connect with other people. And you know that the people in the workspace or maybe in your home that do watch a lot of these different television shows and movies, and seeing how you can start the conversation and traveling towards how that theme really gets to a discussion on the Bible. And finally, it would be for those of you who really enjoy dystopian films but have never thought of the bigger picture of how it connects to, say, the Bible, specifically Revelation. And this is a great talk for you to be able to kind of get you started on the journey, started on the conversation of taking the themes of dystopian films and looking at the bigger narrative that comes through the Bible. So that's who we would really benefit from this talk and also what is dystopian films. And so hopefully you'll be able to come along with us on the journey on pulling back the curtain on dystopia. So what I thought we'd do first before we kind of get into the talks themselves is really look at kind of laying the groundwork of what to expect from this talk. So what will I be covering? So the things that I'll be covering in this will be the similarities of revelation and dystopian films, looking at kind of the separation of these two worlds, and what can we gain also from these similarities and differences? But probably is worthwhile me saying what I won't be talking about, especially for those of you who may be familiar with different talks on the book of Revelation. I won't be going into millennialism. I won't be putting up descriptions of the different images that are, there are in the book of Revelation and how they compare to our future. And this isn't necessarily going to be me working through the book of Revelation itself. It's really going to be more of a general broad brush strokes on both topics. So please kind of give me some license when I look at both of these topics and tend to take some generalizations to both. And finally, especially as a film critic, one of the things I really want to make sure that you're aware of is that I will be putting in some spoilers. There may be some different discussion points that really kind of go to the themes and even the conclusions of specific films. And so I just want to make sure you're aware of that from the beginning. So what I want to do, especially because we're going to be looking at the future, is I'm going to take us back to my past and kind of help you to understand a little bit more of what the subject matter is with this talk. I'm going to take you back to the 80s, and two significant things happened to me at that time. One was that I became a follower of Jesus, and two was that I actually watched my first dystopian film that I can remember. The first one is probably the most significant thing in my life, was that I became a follower of Jesus. I'd grown up in the church, I'd gone to Sunday school, I even went to camps, uh, Christian camps, but it was really the first time that I heard what 
Jesus had done for me. And that's when I became a follower of Jesus, knowing that he had died and rose again and that I am now a follower of his. And it also was the first time I ever really read the book of Revelation. I had my Bible throughout my life, but I'd never really looked at the last chapter. And I went through in the basement of our house by myself, maybe not the best place to do that, but going through and reading Revelation. And here's what was interesting about it, because I can remember it distinctly. It was one, it was scary, it was a bit confusing, it was intriguing, it was exciting, and it was unlike anything else I'd ever read in the Bible before. But then on the flip side, I had another thing happen to me because I did love film even back at that stage when I was a teenager. And there was a guy that was doing a whole bunch of films that maybe you've heard of. His name is Harrison Ford. He would played Han Solo in the Star Wars series and he also had started just doing um, Indiana Jones in the Raiders of the, Alar- uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark series. And I thought this guy was pretty cool, and I really enjoyed it. And also, I saw that he's going to be in this new film from a young British director named Ridley Scott called Blade Runner, based on a book called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And so I went to go see it, thinking it was just going to be another typical Harrison Ford film. And it wasn't. It was completely different. It was written by an author called Philip K. Dick, who had a very unique view of the future. And... In watching it, the thing that was very interesting for me was that it was, one, it was scary, it was a bit confusing, it was intriguing, it was exciting, and it was unlike anything I'd ever seen in cinema before. And this started me on a journey with both of these areas of my life where I'm kind of studying and understanding and knowing more about, one, dystopian films, and two, the Bible. So what I'm going to do first for you in this kind of journey that I've had over these past few years is start by analyzing dystopian films. So how do we do that? Well, what is dystopia? Well, dystopia really finds its heritage in utopia, interestingly enough, and it also deals with the future. If you can take anything away from this talk today, one of the things I would recommend is that when you're thinking about dystopian films, these films address current events through the lens of the future. They address current events through the lens of the future. And with their kind of history in Utopia, which was written by Thomas More, which actually can be translated as no place, Utopia is a place or state or condition that's ideally perfect in respect to politics, laws, customs, and conditions. Now, this seems like heaven, but I'll go through to describe at the end that it's very different than that. But most people really don't sit in a utopian state or the perfect state. And so most of us kind of identify and connect with dystopia. What is dystopia? Well, dystopia is a futuristic imagined universe in which oppressive societal control and the illusion of a perfect society are maintained through corporate, bureaucratic, technological, or moral control. Dystopias through an exaggerated worst case scenario make a criticism about current trends Um, societal norms and political systems. Now, some would say that you could take this all the way back to the beginning of human history in so many different ways and all the different stories that have been told. Even the book of Jonah or the story of Noah in the Bible could be considered dystopian. But modern day dystopia actually is very different and it really finds its history just not too far back with, say, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. H.G. Wells, The Time Machine, A War of the Worlds, George Orwell's 1984, or Farm, Animal Farm, or, as I said before, Philip K. Dick, which most of his books have been made into films, such as Blade Runner, Minority Report, and Total Recall. Utopia is paradise, while dystopia is paradise lost. And so that's where we kind of base it on, as far as dystopia is definitely more of a fear factor involved with it all. A quote from Michael Morgan said this, that dystopia often depicts a quasi-religious kingdom that demands loyalty before the god of the state. There are cautionary tales that really deal with modern anxieties that look into the future. Now, what does that even look like? What does a dystopian film even look like? Well, most of us would be able to go through and pick it out quite quickly. But I found a fascinating article in Vanity Fair that was kind of satirical in a way, but went through and described what we get when we look at dystopian films. One is that the government is evil, 
Humans are not on top anymore. They really unflattering clothing. The food, is, the food is usually horrible. Love is bad, baby making is bad, but interestingly enough, most of the time, children are the future. Education is out though, and individuality is the enemy. The family unit is dead, and almost everything is a sterile environment, but yet seems to be filthy on top of it all. And almost all of the clothing seems to be in shades of beige, gray, or black. Now, this is all kind of done tongue in cheek in this article, but the one thing I found interesting about it is that they brought out two key components that you find in most dystopian films. One is that almost all of these films deal with fear. Fear is one of the driving forces behind dystopian literature. And finally, that there's usually always someone who comes out on top, uh, a hero as it were, an individual or some, so somebody in the community that goes through and really tries to make things right or put humanity back on top. Well, that's what dystopian films might look like. But what are some of the dominating themes that we see in most dystopian films? Well, one is it has to deal with corporate control. This is a large corporation controls society through products and advertising and media. These would be films like Avatar, Minority Report, and Running Man, where propaganda is used to control the citizens of society and information and independent thought and freedom are restricted. This is also usually brought on with another theme, that would be bureaucratic control. That would be societies controlled by mindless bureaucracy through a tangle of red tape, relentless regulations, and independent government officials. It's really the films like The Hunger Games, 12 Monkeys, or Brazil. It's where the concept came from 1984 of where Big Brother is watching you. The third, and probably one of the most familiar to many of us nowadays, would be the technological control. It's where society is controlled by technology through computers, robots, their phones, scientific means. You see this in The Matrix, Terminator, iRobot, where citizens are, in essence, dehumanized in so many different ways, and the natural world is banished and distrusted. And then interwoven is the fourth theme that tends to come along in almost all of these films, and that'd be a philosophical or religious underpinnings, where society is controlled by philosophical or religious ideology, often enforced through a dictatorship or theocratic government, say like The, the Giver or Handmaid's Tale. A figurehead concept or concept is worshiped by the citizens of the society. See, all of these actually can be a part of every single film, but usually you have one of these themes but as I said before, even from the Vanity Fair art article, is that almost a common thread that goes throughout them all is fear. As I said before, if you think about what dystopia does, is it looks at current events and puts it through the lens of the future. And so it could be nuclear war. It could be as we've just kind of traveled through the whole cli-fi or climate change films. I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see some films in relationship to pandemics and other virus-related films, too, coming up. So again, current fears that are kind of put through the lens of the future. Lee Quinby um, wrote an article called the, N the Days Are Numbered, said this, is whether from asteroids, vir viruses, or technologies, these films leave you believing that the end of the world means living in a shadow of fear. But it's usually balanced, interestingly enough, with the need for a hero. Is that almost all of these films have one of two types of heroes. One, either the anti-hero, the one that doesn't necessarily want to be the hero, or the one that is the unaware hero, the one who doesn't even know what they're doing necessarily, that they're trying to help society, but that they're going on some other mission that actually does help society come back on top. The anti-hero and the unaware hero are usually two of the driving forces behind most of what is going on in dystopian films. Now, it does beg the question, doesn't it? Why do we even watch these things? I mean, there are new dystopian films and television shows coming out all of the time, and we seem to be taking them in readily. What is it with these dark and depressing tales that really draw us in? Well, going through various studies and looking at that and considering it, uh, there are four key areas that really drive us to wanting to watch dystopian films, at least based on what scientists say. One is that we have a death anxiety. That we just kind of, everyone knows that we're going to die, so it's kind of mankind's obsession with death. 
Two, it's kind of the guilt factor, is that we think that maybe that the powerless will become powerful and that things will change in some way. I think one of the things that's been driving the last few decades um, in regards to these films would be outrage, anger. Just people are mad and they want the utopia, but they really need to get there by going through dystopia and anger. But interestingly enough, almost all the studies also said something unique is that actually dystopian films are secretly optimistic. That humans can survive anything and that we just need that one thing or that one person to get us to utopia. Meaning that we have to endure dystopia to be able to get to utopia. Dystopian films are fascinating. There's an outrage, there's a fear, and there's an underlying need for a hero. It, it's all pervasive throughout our culture. And again, it's one of those where we're looking at present situations and putting it through the lens of the future. Well, dystopian films, it's a unique thing. It's something that we all kind of go through and experience at different levels and at different times. Now, I'm pulling back the curtain on dystopia, the next section would be to go over Revelation and how does it connect. But first, let's kind of look at it, especially for those who may be not familiar with the book of Revelation or what they've heard about it. I did an unscientific study myself on Facebook asking people what, why they are afraid or maybe don't want to necessarily read the book of Revelation. I found it fascinating, people from all different backgrounds coming in and saying, well, one, it's just hard to interpret, two, it's a bit scary for me, I'm not sure who is right in kind of telling me what's right about it, or finally, just confusion. I, I just don't get it. Um, and so I think that what I'm going to hopefully be able to do is kind of show us how the book of Revelation is, one, accessible, but also how it connects to the topic of dystopian films. See... Revelation really offers us different things. While Revelation does, not, does address the future, like dystopian films, it does it by looking through the lens of the past. Uh, the Old Testament, the Gospels, these are the things that really kind of give us an awareness of what we're looking at in the future. Dystopian films manage the narrative through fear. Well, interestingly enough, even though you may not think this, Revelation actually provides hope. And finally, while most dystopian films have an anti-hero at the heart of the story, what the heartbeat of Revelation and the Bible has is really God's hero. And we're going to look specifically at who this person is of Jesus. Well, it'd probably be worthwhile just reading a portion of Revelation. So I'll do that. Revelation chapter 1, um, just the first few verses. It says this, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants and the things that must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is in it for the time that is near. It's fascinating. It is a letter written to a group of churches by John. He's one of Jesus' friends or disciples. And it's apocalyptic literature, which to the modern ear is kind of a weird thing to be able to say that the word apocalypse actually is interchangeable with the whole word of revelation. That the two words are interchangeable. Even in some translations of the Bible, you'll see that this is called the apocalypse of John. But it's not necessarily the same sort of apocalypse that you and I may think of, especially when we watch dystopian films. What these words really mean is pulling back the curtain, making known what has not been known before. It's so different than maybe what we think of when we think of the word apocalypse or even Revelation itself. A great book, if you haven't really engaged with Revelation for yourself much, is a book by a guy named Paul Barnett. He wrote a book called Apocalypse Now and Then. And he says this about the book of Revelation. One is that the book of Revelation is one of the most neglected books in the New Testament. But he also goes on to say that nonetheless, Revelation has a magnificent and relevant message for us today. Well, as I went through with dystopian films, it's probably be worthwhile me going through and looking at some of the themes and purposes of the book of Revelation. One is that, like I said before, is a letter to a literal seven churches that occurred that were in Roman Asia at the time. 
The audiences is the church, and contextually, without trying to be too minimalistic, the book of Revelation is not only prophetic, but it's also pastoral. It's really a book of discipleship. It's supposed to be one that encourages the churches and the persecuted, the victory of the Lamb, and, and also that following Jesus is worth it until the end. Now, we have to kind of look at how we're supposed to read it. I mean, the meaningful predictive images are really found in the Old Testament. It's not meant to be some weird secret code that we're supposed to be able to predict the end of the world. That's not it at all. The readers are really meant to go and read it, but then also put it through the lens of the past, meaning going back and looking at the Old Testament to understand better what they're reading in the New Testament. It's anchored in the historical context of the churches and places John that he's just addressing exactly what they're going through. It's a letter that, as Ginn says, is pastoral as well as prophetic. But interestingly enough, even though it was written to these churches, it really has a universal message that's really meant for you and I today. It's a motivation for Christians throughout history to stay the course, be a witness for Christ, and have hope in the future. It really could be said that it's meant to reveal a heavenly perspective on history in light of the final outcome. Now, I know what some of you are probably thinking, and I had to think it myself, is why would God use this type of language to go through and talk about the future? Well, in the end, it really comes down to why wouldn't he? Contextually, it completely makes sense. This imagery and language would not have been strange to the first century reader or listener. Uh, they would have been understanding so much of what had been already taught to them in the Old Testament. Really what it comes down to is our biblical illiteracy, as the modern listener is not familiar with the Old Testament, say of Daniel and Ezekiel and other books. And really, even though it may be written for the first century and may be understood better by the first century, it just takes a bit of studying to show that it's really relevant to us even today. Simply, the subject matter needs the word pictures that John conveys. That's why. I mean, how would you go through to describe some of the things that he's seeing, especially in the future? It's hard to not do with, without word pictures. I mean, think about it for a minute. How would you describe the word evil? It's really kind of hard to not do it without looking at a person or a situation that happened throughout history. I mean, John goes on to describe it as being drunk with the blood of the saints, which really kind of brings in, and he relies on human imagination to be able to go and see the extreme element to describing evil. It really, it's not why did he use word pictures, it's why wouldn't he? See, Revelation is like dystopian films that fascinates and perplex people, and as an obscure and controversial book, it is still one that teaches us timeless relevance. See, Apocalypse in the Bible is a revelation about the world, a new perspective uncovering what is previously hidden. The revelation is supposed to provoke a response. Interestingly enough, revelation is supposed to be an encouragement. It does come with a warning on the destruction of what is to come, but also a hope for the future. Biblical apocalypse includes a promise of new and better world, despite the destruction, a new heaven and a new earth. At the heart of the letter, this is really about the faithful and sacrificial hero, Jesus. Unlike the anti-hero and the unaware heroes that we'd be able to see in dystopian films, Jesus is a hero that brings hope that is universal and eternal to all who believe in him. It says in Revelation 21, 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. But also, we can also trust in the fact that he will one day rule. It says in chapter 22, behold, this is Jesus. He says, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. See, Revelation gives us a view of the future through the lens of the past. 
it's, you need to understand that heaven, the new heaven and the new earth, is not utopia, because utopia can be translated as no place. What Revelation shows us and proves to us is that heaven and the new earth are a real place. Also, that Revelation addresses the failures of humanity with salvation through a faithful hero who provides a future hope for all who believe. These are the two positions that I really offer you to today. Dystopian films, which really deal with the whole issue of fear, while Revelation that really deals with the issues of hope. So now what I want to do is travel into looking at the comparison of these two themes, dystopian films and Revelation. We're at the final stage in pulling back the curtain on dystopia where we look at a direct comparison of both dystopian films and the book of Revelation. But I wanted to make sure it's a little bit more accessible for everyone who's watching right now. And so what I wanted to do is we're going to actually travel through probably one of the most familiar dystopian films to most of the audience, and that would be the story of WALL-E, the Pixar film based on the, the garbage pickup robot named WALL-E and his love, Eve. I'll be looking at four key areas when looking at comparing the book of, the book of Revelation with Wally. One is the view of society. Two is the failure of, hum, of mankind. Three is the heroes of society. And finally, the view of the future. So first, we'll be looking at what is society, especially in a dystopian film and in Revelation. Well, for those of you who may not be as familiar, I just need to be reminded, Wally -E is really dealing with Earth when all of humanity has left. It's nowhere to be found because the mega corporation, by and large, or BNL, is a, has sent all of humanity off onto different star liners centuries ago to be able to go and live in their existence far away. It's the 29th century, and it is the only people that are remaining, or the only things that are remaining on Earth, would be trash compactors or waste allocation load lifter, Earth Glass, or Wally. -E. And he's the only one that's actually left. And this little trash compactor is kind of going through and living his existence. And then one day he's interrupted when the Axiom, they've actually sent off a probe named Eve to come through and take care and find out whether or not Earth is now inhabitable. What's interesting about the view of society, if you really look at it from the dystopian view, is that one is that the future is bleak. The predictions are really that there's very limited resources, there's a breakdown in society, and there's really little or no hope, especially in the governments, corporations, and technologies. The only answer seems to come at the hand of a little trash compactor named Wally. Interestingly, when you compare that to the book of Revelation, is that there is destruction actually in the story, but there's also a faith in the future. You see in chapters 6 through 7 of, of Revelation, tyranny, but then you also see it balanced with the great day of the wrath of the Lamb. You see in 8 through 11, you see chaos, but you also see the coming kingdom. You see persecution, the beasts and the dragon that come up in 12 through 14, but then also you see the victorious lamb. You see destruction in 15 through 16, but then you see the end of evil. And then finally, you see an overarching theme of judgment that comes from the beginning of Revelation all the way through, but also a salvation. Revelation is very different in the sense that, yes, it deals with the destruction of this world, but it gives hope to what is to come. Dystopian films depict despair, destruction, and fear, even in a cartoon like Pixar by Wally. -E. But also, Revelation depicts destruction, judgment that is balanced with hope and salvation. Again, similarities, but key differences. The second component of most dystopian films, and especially Revelation, is the fact that humanity fails. As we said, humanity is nowhere to be found in the story of Wally. -E. There's so much rubbish all over the place that it's uninhabitable, and they actually, humanity lives on these star freighters, and they've actually devolved into these blubbering forms on, that are really just taken care of by robots. Humanity has failed itself. 
in most dystopian films, you have a tendency to see the fact that the events of our current time is actually put through the lens of the future. So it could be climate change, which is really depicted in WALL-E, or you can see nuclear war, or tyrannical regimes, or, or different pandemics that are going on around the globe. And the answer that these films offer is really either mankind needs to be isolated, or they just kind of continue in this cycle of tyrannical rule. It's different when you look at and analyze the book of Revelation. Again, that humanity does fail, but salvation is offered to all who believe. If you remember what I said before, is that it was actually written to seven churches, but it also is written to the universal church. It's a hope-filled warning, because you need to understand that the seven churches, five of them, it's noted in Revelation, fail but yet they're still given a gracious warning each time. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear that the Spirit says to the churches. See, for those who read this message, the Lord is merciful and gives everyone the opportunity to turn and repent of their past. There is destruction dis depicted in Revelation, and it is imminent. And humanity really is at the core of the problem. But God is providing an answer of salvation. See, both in dystopian films and in Revelation, you see that humanity fails. But when, where one just offers fear and isolation, the other one addresses humanity's failings with eternal salvation. Which moves us to, how is that enacted? Uh, how do we have salvation in either story? And really both end up coming through the story of the hero of our societies. In Wally, -E, we have a little trash compactor. And I would actually call him an unaware hero. Uh, Wally doesn't really care too much about humanity. He's just about self-preservation and also connecting with his love, another robot named Eve. The, even though he goes on to save humanity in so many different ways in the story, in the end, he really is only doing it based on selfish desire and needs. But that's very different than what we see in the book of Revelation. See, with dystopian films, in almost all of them, you see a fallible hero. It's one that we can connect with because we all fail. Uh, but they're usually unwilling and reluctant in the process of redeeming or saving society. In most instances, they may change the course of history. They may get tyrants out of power, or they may be able to bring humanity back to the earth that they once left behind. But in the end, really what they choose to do or the impact that they have is usually localized and does not have an impact on the rest of society. They're usually unwilling or unaware of even what's going on with all of mankind. And this is different with Revelation. See, what we have is in this revelation, this pulling back to the curtain, is we have Jesus Christ. It's his triumphal return and establishment of the new kingdom it said in chapter 21 of Revelation, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of, the, of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. The focus of this letter is really Jesus. He's given the honor of ruling history. He is the one and only Messiah and ultimately rules the earth. The thing that's very different about Jesus than, say, your dystopian heroes is that he's very aware of what's going on. The impact of what he does and what he's willing to do with his death, death burial, and resurrection is also has an impact throughout all of society and all of history. A very different hero that we have than the one in dystopian films. Which finally kind of brings us down to the final point, the final comparison, as it were. The desolation of humanity or fear. See, in Wally, -E, there is a bit of hope at the end. You see in the final credits, you see humanity kind of getting their act right and, and, and finally trying to take back Earth and do the right thing. But really, what Wally -E offers is very little to the whole scenario outside of maybe some digging apparatuses and opportunities to be able to help mankind. But Revelation has kind of a different story. 
See, with dystopian films, again, as I said, it really leaves you with a shadow of fear despite the hope that may come or this secret optimism that I spoke of before. Well, there's real hope in the book of Revelation. The heart of the letter is grounded squarely in the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. The future hope is found in the past. The victory is found in the cross and the empty tomb that we celebrate at Easter. From the beginning of time, God had a plan to bring salvation to mankind through his son for those who believe. And as it said before in Revelation 21, and he, being Jesus, will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That, my friends, is hope, opposed to what you gain through dystopian films with fear. Well, that's really what you get with your comparison of the views of society, mankind, the heroes of society, and the view of the future. John wrote another couple letters, and specifically one that's called One John. And in the cha fourth chapter, he says this, And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to, this, to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to, be, has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. There's a very different message that you gain from the book of Revelation and also the Bible than what you gain from dystopia. Dystopian films offer uncertainty, while well, the Bible, certainty. Insecurity opposed to security. Remaining in our human failure or eternal salvation. Unwilling and unaware anti-heroes or faithful and willing hero. Simply put, it's fear and hope. There's a stark contrast between these two literary formats. But they do leave you with a choice in the end. What lens do you want to put your life through? Dystopia, revelation. Destruction, salvation. Fear or hope? This is where I put the choice to you. Dystopian films or revelation? Thanks again. This is Russ Matthews, Real Dialogue.